Hello, today I'd like to introduce the idea of an FG module. Now I actually have a question for you guys. I need your help. I have no idea why the word module is in the name FG module here. I know of modules as sort of a generalization of a vector space, where your scalars are just a ring instead of a field, but I'm not sure how that applies in this circumstance. Once we get into the definition, you'll see that we're working with full-blown vector spaces, and so if you know why module is in the name FG module, please let me know in the comments below. So now let's jump into the definition of what an FG module really is. So we start off with a vector space V over some field F, and so then we have V is equal to Fn, right? That could be Rn or Cn, and G is a group. So that's what the F and the G are. This tells us what our vector field is, and this tells us what our group is. Then we say V is an FG module, if there is a multiplication satisfying the following properties. So if you look at this, this is a group element and this is an element of the vector space, right? They live in completely different sets, but if we have some way of combining them, even though they're different objects in different spaces, that satisfies these following properties, then we upgrade that vector space to an FG module. Okay, so the first property is closure. It's just saying if we multiply our group element with a vector, we get something back in that vector space. The next two properties guarantee that our multiplication is a group action. If you've seen group actions before, they satisfy these two properties. That's just saying that if you multiply two group elements and then a vector, that's the same as multiplying the group element with a vector and then the group element after, right? So you can do the group multiplication first or you can do the group vector multiplication first. And then we have that the identity always acts as you would expect, right? The identity acting on a vector gives us back the vector, right? If, if V was a group element, we would be guaranteed this from our group axioms, but V is not a group element. Again, these guys live in different spaces. Then the fourth and fifth properties of our multiplication just guarantee that it's linear, right? We can pull scalars out. Lambda is in the same field that the vector space is over, right? I have, I have what these guys are uh, all up here, if you're nervous about that sort of thing. So we can pull out our scalars, and we have that the multiplication of a sum is the sum of the multiplication. And so if you have these properties, then we upgrade that vector space with that group to an FG module. Now, what does that have to do with representation theory? Well, it turns out that if we represent all of these group elements as matrices, they're gonna satisfy these five properties and we'll have an FG module. So that's what I'm gonna show now. Okay, so we have a representation, right? We have a map from G to G, L, N, F, and we have a vector space F, N. Notice that our representation is over F and our vector space is also over F. And the dimension of our vector space is the same as the degree of our representation. That's just saying we're gonna have N by N matrices with elements of F in our array, and they're gonna be acting on vectors that are going to be a column with N elements each from the field F. You'll see some examples and everything will be exactly what you expect it to be. So we simply define our multiplication to be matrix multiplication. We're familiar with that. It behaves very nicely. So this is actually gonna be a very easy step. So we just say that a group element acting on our vector is just, well, we map it to a matrix and let that multiply with our vector. So we know that a matrix multiplied with a vector is gonna end up back in our vector space because our representation, right, this matrix, the representation of this element is gonna be a matrix, is an endomorphism. An endomorphism, to remind you, is a linear map back to your vector space. And the way that we've set this up, right, this is gonna have elements that are in the same field as this guy right here, right? If this has complex numbers, and this is gonna have complex numbers, you're never gonna have a real vector over Rn. You're never gonna have a real vector living in Rn being mapped by a complex matrix, right? That would ruin closure. But what we have here is that if your vector is real, then your representation is gonna be real. This matrix is real, so this is good. We have our closure. The next property just comes from the associativity of matrices, right? This is a matrix times a matrix times a vector. We can associate these brackets however we see fit. So this one is satisfied from the properties of matrices. So we need that the identity acting on a vector just gives us back the vector. But since rho is a homomorphism, we're guaranteed that it maps the identity to the identity. This guy is guaranteed to be the identity matrix. So we're gonna have that the identity matrix multiplying with a vector just gives us back the vector, check. Okay, we need to be able to pull out scalars. Well, we know that our matrices are linear, so we can pull scalars out. And we need that the product of a sum is the sum of the products. We get that, again, because rho of g is a matrix, and matrix multiplication is linear, so we're good. So then we say v becomes an fg module if we define our multiplication like this. 
So now I want to talk a little bit about some terminology that we had when we were talking about representations and how it carries over to FG modules. Many of the words are used exactly how you would expect them to be, right? An FG module is just a natural extension of a representation because once you've mapped your group to matrices, well, what do you want to do with matrices? You want to see how they act on a vector space and that's exactly what we're doing here. So we say that an FG module is trivial if and only if all group elements acting on any vector will always give back that same vector, right? We have any G in our group and any V in our vector space. If this is always true, right, every group action does nothing, it just leaves that vector unchanged, we say that FG module is trivial. Our action tells us nothing more about that space. And notice that if rho is a trivial representation, right, the trivial representation maps all group elements to the identity, well this is going to be true, because rho of G is just going to be the identity matrix for all G. If our representation is a trivial representation, then its associated FG module is trivial, right? Once we let it act on the appropriate vector space, it's going to become the trivial FG module. I realized during editing that I misspoke when I explained what a faithful FG module is. An FG module is said to be faithful if for all vectors in our vector space, there's some group element that maps V back to V, right? So there's some group element that when it acts on all vectors, always sends them back to themselves, that better guarantee that that group element is the identity. And in terms of representations, that means that it would be the identity matrix. There's only one matrix that you can multiply any vector in our space by and always get your vector back, right, for all V. And that would be G would have to be the identity matrix. And so notice that if our representation is faithful, the only element that gets mapped to the identity matrix is the identity from our group. So if we have a faithful representation and we let it act on a vector space to create an FG module, then we're guaranteed that that FG module is a faithful FG module. The last definition that we talked about with representations was equivalent, and I'm gonna come back to that in another video. That's probably gonna be my next video, looking at how equivalent representations show up when we're talking about them in light of an FG module. If you wanna start thinking about that, remember that equivalent representations are the same representation just written in a different basis. So how do you think that that is going to affect how that representation acts on a vector space? Okay, so finally, I'd like to actually give an example of an FG module. I forgot to write the group and I just snuck it up in the top, but this is an example that we've looked at a couple of times. We'll probably come back to it again in the future. Um, so if we have our group being D8, recall that's the symmetries of a square. This is one of the representations that we were looking at. And if we let that act on R2, right, because this is a real representation. It's also complex, we could let it act on C2, but I'm gonna keep things simple and let it act on R2. If we know how these two matrices act on these two vectors, well, any group element can be written as a combination of these two matrices, and any vector can be written as a combination of these two unit vectors. So we know everything about how multiplication could happen between the group and our vector space. Now, I picked these two unit vectors because they're the easiest unit vectors to work with. These actually don't have to be unit vectors, right? I gave them little circumflexes, right, these hats, um, because they are unit vectors, that's some physics notation, if you're not familiar with it. But these could be any basis vectors. As long as they're a basis for R2, then we're good to go. The book defines everything as a right action. Here we have our group element acting on the left, so we say it's a left action. In the book, they have it acting on the right, so it's a right action. These calculations are actually going to turn out to be a little bit different, but I'm following the convention uh, where we have functions acting on the left, so I'm going to have the action on the left as well, whereas the book has functions mapping from the right, so they have a right action, and I find that very confusing. So here we just have basic matrix vector multiplication, and I summarize the results in this table. Right, for an FG module, in general, it doesn't have to be a representation. So I wrote this in more general no notation. We have that A acts on E1 to give us minus E2. B acts on E1 and it leaves it unchanged. A acts on E2 and gives us E1. B acts on E2 and it picks up a minus sign. So this tells us all the information we need for V to be an FG module. In this case, it's going to be an RD8 module. Right, so if we have G is D8, V is R2, rho maps from D8 to GL2R then V is an FG module, namely an RD8 module. Now to give you a better idea of what's going on, I've drawn a little picture. I've just taken this information that we have here, I've taken these unit vectors and shown where they get mapped to in a little R2 plane, and I think that'll really help illustrate what's going on here. Right, so the way that I've written it, a general vector has an X component and a Y component. So here's E1 and E2. So first let's look at the action of A. So A takes E1 and maps it down to minus E2. So it started here 
and goes down here. And A takes E2 and sends it to E1. So it starts here and ends up down here. So the only way that that can happen is if A, the action of A, is a rotation by 90 degrees. That's the only way that we can get E1 to end up at minus E2 and E2 to end up at E1. So A is a rotation of 90 degrees which is what we should have expected because D8 is the symmetries of a square and A is the element that rotates by 90 degrees and B is a reflection. So let's check if our intuition where B should be a reflection actually works out in our little picture here. Well, what does B do to E1? B takes in E1 and spits out E1, right? The multiplication with B does nothing to E1, so it goes back to itself, okay? But what does it do to E2? It takes E2 and sends it to minus E2. So that is a reflection about the x-axis. And all of D8 can be constructed with a 90 degree rotation and an, a reflection about the appropriate axes, but that's what we would expect. So here we found that this FG module takes vectors in R2 and maps them based on symmetries of D8, right? The symmetries of a square, just as we would expect. Now the question is, how can we use this to learn more information about D8? And that is coming up. I'm gonna give some more examples of FG modules before I get there though. I want to talk about equivalent representations and how those affect FG modules. And I want to talk about permutation modules. So those are gonna be the next two videos. And then we're going to look at some more examples and see how we can use FG modules to tell us more about our groups, which at the end of the day is the point of representation theory and FG modules, is to find out information about our groups. But that's everything for today's video. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I'll see you for the next video.